I'm Donald Leggett from the Investor website, London Southeast. I'm joined today by Milan Radia, Technology Analyst at Investment Research House, Hardman & Co. Today, we'll cover the technology megatrends for 2021 and beyond. Bitcoin is riding high again, but to what extent is it a serious asset class? We'll tap into the digitization story. Is there more to play for? And which stocks and sectors are the likely beneficiaries of those relentless mega trends? Welcome, Lan, and thank you for joining us today. Good afternoon, Donald. And where are you today, Milan? I am in the Middle East, so traveling, so uh, far away from the cold of London. Very exotic. <laughs> so uh, to, des to, to describe you as a tech expert is really to downplay your financial and technology experience. So I'm going to start off by asking you to briefly highlight a couple of things that, the, that you've done in your career that you think are, help make you the, the, the expert you are. Uh, well, it's actually some 27 years ago that I joined the city as a graduate. And I actually started my career in fund management, uh, UK equities and after about five or six years, I was running some 350 million pounds across a number of different funds. That involved meeting a lot of management teams, making some decisions on which were the right companies to invest in. And around 99, I actually turned to the sell side, joining a fund, an investment bank called UBS Warburg. And ever since then, I focused on the technology and telecom sectors, meeting thousands of companies and management teams to understand what makes them tick. So gives me a healthy backdrop, I think, to contextualize companies as I, as I meet them today. Fantastic, Milan. You're the, you're the man for the job. Um, could you summarize a few of the major technology trends which are changing our lives in 2021 and beyond? I think it's fair to say that we're going through a period of extraordinary change. Technology is, is amending every corner of the way that we live, we work, how we communicate, how we get from A to B, how we order food, how we watch content you know, on TV. It's changed everything that we do and it's disrupting uh, a lot of the ways, traditional ways that things were done. Uh, and you know, I've got a couple of charts which you can just turn to on this. And if you turn to uh, the chart showing what we do in a typical minute, the internet minute chart as it's called, those figures are staggering when you look at how much data that we're consuming, how much on online activity that we're going through every minute of the day on average around the world. And these trends are just starting, you know, in continents like Africa, where you've got a wealth of young people. This whole internet penetration story is just very much in its, in its infancy. And a couple of more slides that just spell this out. You look at the subscriber growth at Disney Plus. Now, they set up this service a year ago, and they met their five-year estimates for where they would be within the first sort of six to nine months. Extraordinary. And Netflix, you'll see that they've been growing in a very, very secular fashion for years and years as people sort of change the way they like to, to consume this content. So we are going through an incre incredible period of, of change with digitization and digital adoption at the heart of what we do. Is this growth likely to stick though? I mean, Netflix subscriber numbers are great, but, but will they slide back 20% when lockdown is over? I mean, what's, what's your view on that? Well, there's no doubt that the pandemic has created a bit of a step change in our online activity. And the CEO of Microsoft said something very interesting uh, around a year ago, actually, when he talked about, or just less than a year ago, when he talked about two years worth of digitization having happened in just a couple of months in the early phases of the lockdown. And there's no doubt that we saw that step change, but the charts you saw are up to date. You know, they take into account the sort of period within the lockdown once the online activity kind of perhaps took a little bit of step back as people went back to work and, and so on. These are secular trends. These are long-term shifts that we're seeing and we're, we're, not, we're not by any means complete. And is that what investors should be looking for? Should be they looking to, to ride those long-term waves and not be too worried about the, the end point because, because quite frankly, it, it, our lives are going to be changed for a very long time. It's never wrong to think about things on a very long-term basis. You know, you know, how are things going to evolve over the next decade, the next 15 years? Think about where we've come from and where we're heading to. At the same time, people have to be focused on valuation. And what you tend to find in these kind of markets with retail investors becoming a big, big component of stock markets, and we've seen some extraordinary movements driven by retail investors in the recent past, sometimes valuation gets forgotten. So thinking about when the right time to get involved um, is, is very important. And, and typically, it's, it's right to get involved when people are scared. Okay. Uh, you know, when there's volatility and when people are shying away 
from the market, it's always a good time to start thinking about um, whether it's right to be investing. Which takes us nicely to Bitcoin, which I see as a little bit of a bubble. I see it as quite frothy at the moment. Um, do you think it has a future as an asset class, as some suggest, or is it more the way that I think, that it's a, it's a bubble? I think in some, many respects you're right. Uh, you know, first of all, I think we need to understand that Bitcoin is a cryptocurrency. And it's not all about blockchain. Blockchain actually is potentially extremely valuable technology. So I don't think that we should be thinking about the two necessarily in tandem. And other cryptocurrencies are perhaps more sensibly valued, if that's the right term. But, you know, people think about Bitcoin as being a gold substitute and so on. But what's the intrinsic value of Bitcoin? You know, gold, we know there's intrinsic value. Around the world, people treasure it and value it, whether it's in a Federal Reserve vault or whether it's for jewelry. But there is a, a genuine underlying demand for that. With a company, we can think about the intrinsic value by looking at the cash flows and valuing those cash flows. How do you do that with Bitcoin? It's really about how much people use it. And there's no predictability around that. It's very speculative right now. And I'm sure, Donald, the Bitcoin supporters will say to me, well, we'll look at Tesla. If Elon Musk is buying a billion and a half dollars of Bitcoin, it's going to be great. Well, you know, Cynic might say there's a lot of Bitcoin stock out there. The holders of it don't quite know what to do with it. And now Elon is offering them the ability to buy a Tesla with, you know, a small fraction of that. And that'll certainly help his, his car sales. But I don't think we necessarily need to think of that as underlying validation of the long term prospects of, of Bitcoin. So I think investors need, need to be a little bit careful. What will Elon Musk do if the that Bitcoin price halves and he sold his car for half its value. There was a time recently when many people and analysts and Morgan Stanley were saying Tesla was worth zero and he rode out the wave. Uh, you know, so uh, I think his attitude will be very similar on Bitcoin where he'll just basically say to people, wait and see, I'll be right and time will tell. I was in a Scottish mortgage and um, I rode the Tesla wave. So I'm, I, I do accept that Tesla is an, it's a bit of a one-off stock, isn't it? Okay, yes. uh, let me take you to Amazon. Well, Tesla, of course, Apple, Microsoft, all those made huge gains last year. They were, they were the fundamental drivers of the, the US uh, stock markets. So where should we look for the tech growth stocks of the future? So I think coming back to the trends we talked about, it's not all about the fangs, as they're called, in terms of technology adoption and transformation. There's a lot of good things happening. And we talked about the big change in how consumers act and live and so on. The enterprises and the companies that service those consumers are having to also adapt. And so the, the companies that deliver those technologies to allow that automation and adaptation to happen are good investments. And one of the big areas that certainly we're looking at is enterprise automation. So during the pandemic, how many of us struggled to get hold of our customer service representatives at our mobile operator or our satellite TV provider, it was, became impossible for some period of time. And those types of companies have realized that actually it would be much better to automate that customer facing activity, for example. So you make contact with Vodafone, a chat bot will take you through the steps. And if you've got a good platform, this AI based technology will solve 80% of the the queries that come in. So there's a lovely company called Artificial Solutions based in Sweden that's doing exactly that. They're basically a, a relative minnow in market cap terms, but they are providing this kind of platform technology to some of the largest enterprises in the world. In fact, if you book a Skoda test drive anywhere in Europe, you'll be interacting with a chatbot built on Artificial Solutions platform. They call it her Lucy, uh, but lots of companies are building their equivalents and that's a big, big trend. Um, why, no, why has Lucy been effective? Uh, because it's real time. You know, in the middle of the night, if someone decides they want to have a look at Skoda vehicles, uh, they'll get there and then Lucy will pop up and say, I noticed you've been looking at this car. How about I offer you a test drive on Saturday morning? Come and check it out. And then, oh, perfect. Yeah, that sounds like a good idea. Saves the individual having to make contact proactively and carve out some time to get through to a call center. The appointment is scheduled real time. It's confirmed, and that has an Im immense impact on the conversion rates of Skoda cars, potentially. So Volkswagen started with one market and they rolled it out across all markets, so they're obviously having some, some success. And have you got other examples for us? Uh, there's another, another interesting company called Blue Prism, and they're in the robotic process automation market, which sounds like a mouthful, but these are software robots, not little tin aluminium uh, robots, but they're programmed to do administrative tasks. So 
if someone asks to open a bank account, a software robot can go all through, through all of the steps and ask for the information that a human would otherwise ask for, but obviously at a much higher level of accuracy and a much higher level of speed, 24 seven. So enterprises are unsurprisingly are very, very keen on these type of productivity enhancing technologies and they're seeing very, very strong growth. So is the digitization story now essentially done and over or is there more to go for? You might think that there's been so much digital adoption that we're somehow you know, well through this story. I think we're actually in the infancy of what's happening here. And I'll give you an example. People talk a little bit about the internet of things and that means connected devices, throwing up and collecting lots of data. We have them in our Apple watches, we have them in our cars, you have them on aeroplanes. If you ever look at a wing, you'll see about 10 of them scattered across the wing. You have them on tractors. What are they doing? Well, they're collecting data and they're predicting when maintenance might be required or what the crop yield will be on an arable farm. And all of this type of thing is, is happening now and literally terabytes of data are being accumulated every minute of the day. Uh, the type of companies that we should be looking for are those that are providing the smart technologies that underpin these Internet of Things or IoT platforms. So one nice example is Sign Canode, which is a leader in the production of smart metering technology. And they're working with all the meter, meter manufacturers in the key markets, supplying the intelligent modules that slot inside them and make them smart. Uh, and in India, for example, the government is planning to roll out 250 million smart meters over the next few years. Sign Canode is a key supplier into this market. Thailand and other markets are joining the fray. So there's a great example of a small UK tech company that is firmly positioned to benefit from some of these IoT type trends. So there's real potential in, available outside of these mega cap stocks that are arguably you know, fairly fully valued. Okay, and anything else you'd like to tell, uh, talk to us about today, Milan? Well, I just think that you know, ultimately you know, with investors, Think about data. The common theme through everything we've talked about today is really data. Data is at the heart of uh, you know, the IoT trend, the AI trend, some of the ways we think about and consume content. Um, and so data centers are probably the final area that people should be thinking about. You know, that's where the cloud lives. Everyone talks about the cloud. That's where all of the content you upload to Facebook lives and Instagram and all of this highly used type content. The interesting the ones are the ones where a lot of connectivity lives. Um, and so look at digital realty in the US, very, very strong uh, player in these markets with highly connected data centers. There's a UK company that's private, which is Pulsant. Uh, that's quite an interesting play. That'll come to market one day, I'm sure. But that's that common theme. So I leave, leave investors with that thought. That think about anything that's in the intelligent data space as a theme as they look to explore some of these, some of these areas of the market. Milan Radia, technology analyst at Hardman & Co. Thank you so much for your time. That was absolutely fascinating. Meanwhile, thank you for watching and do stay safe.